Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Daniel Revelation seminar. How many of us are excited to be here tonight? Amen. All right, how many of us have been enjoying our Daniel, our God's Daniel and Revelation seminar here in Kadena? Amen. I hope that you guys have been uh, receiving a blessing. Before we begin tonight, uh, our quiz, let us start off with a short word of prayer, and then we'll go into our three-question quiz, nightly quiz. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for allowing this opportunity to meet once more to study your word. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to get to know you better. And Father, we want to invite your presence to be with us now, Lord, as we open your word and as we study. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be our true teacher, to lead us and to guide us into all truth, that the truth shall set us free. Father, please open our hearts and minds to the message this evening. Speak to us tonight, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our first question. Are you guys ready for the quiz? If you have uh, answered and got the uh, correction questioned, I mean the question correct, then you are exempted from taking the quiz tonight. All right, so we're going to look at three questions from last night. Last night we talked about the great controversy, and it's found in Revelation chapter 12. And whoever gets the question right, uh, we will have prizes, and uh, Brother Renz will help and give you the prizes as well. And if you have the correct answer, you can go ahead and sh grab the mic and then share it in the microphone so that we can hear. All right, so our first question that we have is, number one, Satan deceived one-third of the angels with his tail. According to Isaiah 9.15, what does the tail represent? The lies, correct. Good job. Renz will come over and give you the prize. She's correct, everyone. The tail represents a prophet that teaches lies. How did Satan deceive the angels? It was lies about the character of God in heaven. All right, so question number two. What does the Greek word for war, polemos, mean? What does the Greek word for war, polemos, mean? Anyone like to try? All right, we have one. Arguments. Arguments. Good. Arguments. It's simplified. The Greek word for polemos just simply means argument. She got it correct. Strife, quarrel, dispute, or argument. And by the way, the war in heaven was a conflict of ideas, beliefs, and wills. So it wasn't a physical battle. It wasn't a bloodshed war. It was more of wills and beliefs and ideas. It was an argument, a word fight. All right, good job. All right, last but not least, question number three. Why did Satan go into war with Michael? Why did Satan go into war or battle with Michael? Anyone? All right. He wanted to be higher than God. Correct. You got it correct. All right. So the, question, uh, the answer is Satan wanted to be like God, not in character, but in position or authority. He wanted to have the position or authority of God. He wanted to take the place of God, and he was jealous of God's worship and wanted the praise of the entire universe. That was on his heart. That was, his, that was on his agenda, his mind, that he wanted to be not just like God, but also like above, more than God. He wanted to be the God of the universe to receive worship. All right, everyone, thank you so much um, for sharing your, your answers. Um, by the way, I'm going to make an announcement again, like I did last night. Um, on Sunday, which is our final night, uh, we're going to be doing, instead of me preaching uh, a seminar, um, we're going to be doing a panel 
a discussion, a question and answer. And uh, before Sunday, we would like for you guys to give us your questions. You can give it to Mom uh, Barredo in the group chat, if you guys have. And uh, send all your questions to Mom Barredo, and then she can send it to, to me. And then uh, our team will go ahead and find the answers for you guys, so that on Sunday, we can put the questions on the screen so everybody can see the questions and answers. Is that, is that OK, everyone? Yeah? OK. I'm sure you guys have questions about Daniel Revelation. Uh, please feel free to send your questions to Mom Barreto in the group chat, and then she'll send it to me. All right, let us bow our heads one more time for another word of prayer before we go into our message. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for again bringing us here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for calming the rains. And Father, we just want to ask, Lord, that you once again Please be present here this evening, Father, as we discuss a very important topic and as we understand more about your saints here on earth. And so, Father, we ask and pray, Lord, for your spirit again to give us wisdom and understanding. Speak to our hearts and convict us, Lord, of sin, that we may follow the Lamb wherever he goes. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone, is everyone ready to study? All right, so this evening, our message is entitled, Who are the 144,000? Who are the 144,000? Tonight, we're going to be looking at the identity of God's end time saints, God's saints in the last days. Who are they? What is their characters? Are they symbolic? Is it literal? Uh, is the 144,000? Um, will they ever experience death or will they not experience death? And is Ellen White part of the 144,000? Can we be a part of the 144,000? What does this number represent in Bible prophecy? And so tonight, I hope you brought your Bibles. I'm going to put the verses on the screen so you can follow along uh, with me. The first place that I want to go to in studying the 144,000 is in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 7 uh, mentions the 144,000, but we need to go back to chapter 6 to understand the context uh, of the 144,000. So why don't we go to Revelation chapter 6, it's on here on the screen, and start with verse 14. The Bible says, Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, what did they do, everyone? Hid themselves. Where? In the caves and where? In the rocks of the mountains. If, you were, if I was to ask you what scene is this, is this verse describing, what event is this about? It's the second coming of who, everyone? Jesus, Jesus is coming back to this earth and all these people, the, the kings of this earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, they're basically telling the mountains, mountains, rocks, fall on us and hide us from Jesus. You'll notice that in the very next verse. Notice the next verse. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from who, everyone? The face of him, that's Jesus, who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and what is the question, everyone? Who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? Now, this concludes Revelation chapter 6 and verse 17. This is the last verse of Revelation chapter 6. Now, in order to answer this question, who is able to stand, guess what verse or chapter we must read next? Chapter 7. Good job. Chapter 7, and look, starting with verse 1, and then we're going to see how will they stand, who is able to stand. Notice what chapter 7 and verse 1 says. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, the sea, or on any tree. So John sees how many angels here? Four angels standing where? 
at the four corners of the earth. Is there four corners of the earth here? Do you guys know north, south, east, and west? The angels are standing at the four corners of this world. And what are they doing, everyone? It says that they are holding the four winds on this earth. Now, the question is, what are these four winds? What does these four winds represent? Well, let's, let's notice the next verse. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of what, everyone? The living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to what, everyone? Harm the earth and the sea. What are the four angels about to do? They're holding back the winds, and the winds, if they let go of the winds, then it will harm who, everyone? The earth and the sea. This is describing the time of trouble. This is describing the great tribulation or the seven last plagues. Now, the angels are holding back these winds for one purpose and for one, for one reason. What is that reason? Notice the next verse. Saying, do not harm the earth, the sea or the trees till we have what everyone sealed the servants of our god where everyone on their foreheads meaning to say before the time of trouble the angels are are holding back the winds for one purpose and one purpose only that one purpose is so that god's servants will be sealed with what everyone the seal of god these people are waiting for it to be, God is waiting for his people to be sealed. Now notice the next verse. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 140, how many? 44,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were, were sealed. So let me quickly review. In the 144,000, we see some main points here. The first point is that they are able to stand at the second coming of Jesus. They are not the ones hiding from the rocks, I mean hiding from Jesus and telling the rocks to fall on them. They are standing in the presence of Jesus. Number two, they are sealed with the seal of God. They are sealed with the seal of God. Number three, they are sealed before the four winds are released or the time of trouble, the great tribulation or the seven last plagues are released. They are of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So these are some of the characteristics of the 144,000. But now we need to understand what included, what was included in the tribes of Israel, the children of Israel. I put here a comparison of Genesis 49 and Revelation 7. Basically, Genesis 49 is the original 12 tribes of Israel. These are the sons of Jacob, and these are all the, the tribes that is represented in Genesis 49. But when you take a look, when you take a careful look at it, you're going to see something different. All of the names kind of match up, except for who, everyone? Dan and Manasseh, you're going to see that there is a mix-up. There, uh, there is one person not included in Revelation chapter 7, verses 5 through 8. Now, we need to ask the question, why is Dan, why is Dan not included in this, this list in Revelation? We need to understand who Dan was. Let's look, at, let, let's look at who Dan was. Genesis 49, verse 17 says, Dan shall be a what, everyone? A serpent. What does a serpent remind you of? Satan, right? Like from last night, we studied about the serpent. <clears throat> by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backwards. When you study the character of Dan, he basically apostatized. He basically rebelled against God. And so that's one reason why his name is not listed in the new uh, list in Revelation. Isn't it interesting, like when you look at this list, when you think of the 12 tribes, how many disciples did Jesus have? It was, he had 12 disciples, right? But in the 12 disciples, how many of them had killed or, or committed suicide or had betrayed their Lord? It was one, what was his name? It was Judas. 
when you look at the new list of the disciples, Judas' name is not listed in the original of the 12. Does that make sense, everyone? All right. Something interesting about these, these children of Israel was that they had all been conquerors. They had all overcome sin in, in their own various ways, in their own lives. And as a result, their names are being mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, verse 5 through 8. Now, we looked at Dan. Notice, notice this name, Manasseh, right? Why is Manasseh's name included in here? We need to understand who Manasseh was. According to 2 Chronicles 33, it says here, Now when he was in affliction, this is Manasseh, he implored the Lord his God, and he, what everyone? Humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed to him, and he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Is this good news? Yes. When you study the history of Manasseh, Manasseh was very uh, rebellious against God at first. And God allowed him to be taken to Babylon as a captive. And while he's in prison, he begins to humble himself. He begins to come back to Jesus. He begins to cry out to God, and God heard his cry for help. And as a result, he's taken back from Babylon, back to his kingdom in Jerusalem, and Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. And so why is his name in, installed in Revelation? It was because he humbled himself before God. Can you say amen? Now, we're moving on in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After these things, after the, the 12 tribes that was mentioned, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with what kind of robes? White robes with palm branches in their hands. Now, <clears throat> and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits, where everyone? On the throne and to the Lamb. Now, I want to summarize what we just read here on these points. So let's look at point number five. Number five, the 144,000 are all nations, are of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. They stand before the throne. They stand before who, everyone? The Lamb, that's Jesus. They are clothed with white robes. They have palm branches in their hands, and they cry out, salvation belongs to our God. Now, we need to understand the next verse after this. In verse 13, it says, then one of the elders, who is the elders here? How many elders are there in the throne room of God? There is 24 elders. Then one of the answers answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? Isn't that a valid question? Who are these people? Who are, who are, they talking, who are we talking about here? The next verse, verse 14 says, And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of where, everyone? What is another name for great tribulation? It's the seven last plagues, or you could also say, not just the seven last plagues, you could also say the time of trouble. They washed their robes and made them white in whose blood? In the blood of the Lamb, that's Jesus. They Isn't this beautiful? Amen? Now let's summarize what we just read here. Number, point number 11. They come out of great tribulation. That's referring to the time of trouble and the seven last plagues. This basically means that they will not be killed. They will not experience death. They will be alive and they will survive during the time of trouble or the seven last plagues. This is the 144,000. And then um, point number 12, they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, meaning they had the character of Jesus. White is a symbol of purity. They had the pure character 
of Jesus, and they wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Now, I want to go back into Daniel chapter 11 before I go into um, the next thing that we're going to study here. And the reason why I'm going back to Daniel 11, we need to understand the context. We need to understand the chronology, the chronological, how do you see this word? Chronological, chronological, ah, chronological, ah, chronology of, of the events that's happening in Daniel. Okay. So the first thing that we have, the first power that we have is Medo-Persia. By the way, who, who comes before Medo-Persia? Babylon, right? After Medo-Persia comes Greece. After Greece comes Rome. And during the time of Rome, we see the birth of Jesus, the baptism of Jesus, and the death of Jesus, all being uh, foretold in the 70 weeks prophecy. Now in Daniel chapter 11, it also mentions about papal Rome. And when did they rule? 538 until 1798. This is known as the Dark Ages. They ruled for 1,260 years. But then after the, after the Dark Ages, in the year 1798, the papacy receives a deadly wound, meaning to say it is temporarily destroyed. That happens in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. And then, after the deadly wound is, is destroyed, later on, the deadly wound begins to be healed. This is referring to the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church papacy. The papacy begins to heal. After they begin to heal, then they have the deadly wound, the, or sorry, the deadly wound, that's the people of Rome. They attempt to kill who, everyone? God's saints. You can find that in Daniel chapter 11, verse 41 through 45. They attempt to kill God's saints. And who are the saints living during this time? Because I, I want you to, well, before you answer that question, okay. So they attempt to kill God's saints. After they try to attempt God's saints, by the way, it's not included here, but I'm going to give you, um, we're going to give you more details later on when Renz preaches on Revelation 13, Papal Rome will also have this thing called a National Sunday Law. Have you guys heard of that? And as a result of the National Sunday Law, they're going to have a death decree. A what, everyone? A death decree. And they're going to attempt to kill God's saints. Now, I'll save the, the details for Renz later on. But after they try to attempt God's people, then in, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it says that Michael stands up. What does it mean when Michael stands up? Who is Michael referring to, by the, by the way? Michael refers to Jesus. When Jesus stands up, what does that mean? Probation is closed. Probation is closed. Michael stands up. Before, he's sitting down because he's doing the work of investigative judgment. Now, probation has closed. Michael stands up. And the very next thing that you see is the time of trouble. And what is the time of trouble, everyone? The seven last plagues or the great tribulation. And after the great tribulation, the seven last plagues, then you have in Daniel 12, verse 1, you have the second coming of Jesus. And then you have the resurrection. Does this make sense, everyone? Now, during this time, when the saints are being persecuted all the way until the second coming of Jesus, guess what? The saints are not going to die. They will be persecuted. They will be tempted to leave Christ. They will be tortured. They will be uh, thrown in prison. They will be running to the mountains, but they will never experience death, as inspiration tells us. And also, the Word of God tells us that too. So now, with this in mind, now we're going to study the 144,000. Um, I'm going to skip here. <clears throat> so let's go here. Verse, Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2 to 4. The reason why I showed that was because I wanted to help you to understand the cr cr chronology of everything. Okay, Revelation 15, verse 2 to 4, it says... And I saw something like a sea of glass 
mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over who, everyone? The beast. Over his, what, everyone? His image, and over his mark, and over the number of? Now, we don't have the time to go over this, but if I could just summarize who is this beast, if you just go to Revelation chapter 13, you're going to see two beasts. How many beasts? You're going to see two beasts. You're going to see that one beast, the first beast that comes out in Revelation chapter 13, represents none other than papal Rome, which is what we saw in Daniel chapter 11 and Daniel chapter 12. Papal Rome will persecute God's saints. They will try and attempt to kill God's saints. Now, they, these people had the victory over papal Rome. They had the victory over his image. We'll cover the image later on. They had the victory over his mark, the mark of the beast, which is enforced worship, and over the number of his name, which is 666. You can look it up in Revelation 13. All of these four points are there. Meaning to say, the 144,000 will have the victory over papal Rome, and they will survive during the great tribulation, the seven last plagues. Amen? And then it says, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Now notice the next verse. They sing the song of who, everyone? Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the who, everyone? O King of the saints. These group of people, the 144,000, sings the song of Moses. And if you're wondering what is the song of Moses, you could just go to Exodus chapter 15 and you'll read the experience of the song of Moses. Now, we don't have the time to go into that. All right, so they sing the song of Moses. And then they say, Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Now, I'm going to summarize what we just learned here. The 144,000 have the victory over the beast. That's papal Rome. They have the victory over his image. That's apostate Protestantism and the, and the, and the Sunday law, national Sunday law. They have the victory over his mark. That's the papal Sabbath, Sunday worship. They have the victory over the number. That's 666. We're gonna, Renz is going to cover what 666 is later on. And they sang the song of who, everyone? They sang the song of Moses. Now, I'm going to go back to my slides that I, that I skipped so that we can understand more about now the character of the 144,000. What does the character of the 144,000 uh, actually look like? So right now we're going to study Revelation chapter 14 verses 1 through 5. It gives us a clear, distinct view about the character of the 144,000. Notice what it says here. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing where everyone? On Mount Zion. And with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their forehead. Notice what it says next. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. Doesn't it sound familiar from the previous verse? They were playing harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. What song is this, everyone? The song of Moses. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. There are 24 elders here. And no one could learn that song except who, everyone? The 144,000 who were what? Redeemed from the earth. What does that word redeem mean? It means bought back or purchased. And how were they purchased? Through whose blood were the 144,000 purchased? Through the blood of the Lamb. That's Jesus. Amen? These are the ones who were not defiled with women. For they are what, everyone? They are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. 
These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Now, last of this, this part. And in their mouth was found no what, everyone? Deceit. What does deceit mean? It's like lies. Meaning to say, everything in their mouth was the truth. For they are without fault, meaning they had not sinned, before the throne of God. Their characters were perfect. Because if they had any sin in them, next to Jesus, God is a consuming fire. They would perish. They had a, a sinless character before God himself. Can you say amen? Now let's recap what we just learned from here. Basically, the 144,000, they are standing in Mount Zion with the Lamb. That's Jesus. They have God's name or God is love, his character is love, in their foreheads. They have sang a new song, which only they could learn it. They're the only ones who could experience it. They are not defiled with women. They are virgins. And 16, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Now, I'm going to go back to 14. It says that they have, they, sung, they sing a new song, which only they could learn. Notice how it says, which only they could learn. Nobody else in the entire Bible, in the entire history, could ever sing this song unless you are the 144,000. Now, why is this? Because the 144,000 had escaped the little horn power. Does that make sense, everyone? They had escaped the little horn power, which is papal Rome, and its attempt to kill them or to destroy them from the face of this earth because of the National Sunday Law. They had escaped those, uh, those things, and not only that, they had also escaped the seven last plagues or the time of trouble. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. They were also redeemed. They were first fruits to God. Their, their, their mouth was found no deceit, meaning there was truth in them, and they were without fault. Amen? Okay, so now I'm going to skip back after this one. Okay, now I want to read to you a quote. This is Selected Messages, page 174. We're almost done here. It is not his will that they shall get into, into what, everyone? Controversy over questions, questions which will not help them spiritually, such as who is to compose the what, everyone? The 144,000. This, those who are the what, everyone, the elect of God, will in a short time know without question. Now, what is Ellen White telling us here? What is this, this message telling us here? It's telling us that we should not get into controversies discussing who's going to be saved, who's going to be part of the 144,000, right? It says we should not get into controversy over questions which will not help them spiritually, does knowing who's going to be saved going to help you spiritually? No, probably not, right? And the question that she even put out here is, who is to compose the 144,000? Meaning to say, who is going to be part of this number? We are, not to under, we are not to have a controversy or a debate about these things. But notice what she says in the last line. This, those who are the elect of God, will in a short time know without question who will understand who the 144,000 will be. The elect of God, they will know in a short time without question who the 144,000 is. They may not know the names of who will be saved, but they will know without a question, as inspiration tells us, who is the 144,000. Now, here's another quote. Let us strive together with all the power that God has given us to be among who, everyone? The 144,000. And let us do all that we can to, to what, everyone? Help others to, to gain heaven. Is that good news? It is good news. 
even though she does say we should not have a debate or a controversy about who the 144,000, who's going to be saved, is this person going to be saved, is this person going to be saved, we should not have a controversy about that. But she also says, she doesn't say don't study who the 144,000 is. She says that we should strive to be among that 144,000. Can you say amen? But not only that, she says, let's do everything that we can to help others to gain heaven. How many of us want to gain heaven? Amen? amen. Now we need to ask an important question. Is it literal or is it symbolic? I'm going to read just a few questions. I'm, I'm not going to tell you if it's literal or symbolic. I'm just going to try to reason. And I hope that we can think tonight. If there will be only 144,000 faithful living saints when Jesus comes, then we would have to conclude that God predetermined, pre-chose, or handpicked them. By the way, predestination is not a biblical teaching. If they were literal, then we would have to conclude that God had pre-picked or handpicked them to be already saved, which is called predestination, which is not biblical. If it were literal, then that means only literal Israel would be saved. And everyone else, including you and I, would be lost if it was literal. If it were literal, then the 144,000 are all literal virgins. Too bad, all parents. <laughs> you will not make it into heaven. You will not make it into that 144,000. I'm just trying to reason. I'm not trying to say it's symbolic or literal or not. I'm just trying to reason. If it were literal, then 144,000 are all literal virgins. This means that everyone, who, I don't know why I put this. <laughs> this means that everyone who's had sex before will not make it. If you had sex before, you will not make it because you're not a virgin once you have sex. And all parents cannot be a part of this number. I'm just trying to reason with you guys, okay? I hope we're thinking here. If it were literal, then why would the 144,000 be preaching the three angels' message to the world if there are no one else that would be saved except them? Does that make sense? If it were literal, then why preach the three angels' message if they are the ones who are going to be saved? Because the three angels' message involves the gospel of salvation. Does that make sense, everyone? And last but not least, if it were literal, then why Revelation is a book of symbols? Why does it talk about the dragon, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the little horn? I mean, you think about it, when you, when you read and study Revelation, is Revelation and Daniel talking about a literal lion? Is it talking about a literal bear? Is it talking about a literal leopard? How about a dragon? How about time, times, and a half of times? How about the 2300 days? If it were literal, then you'd have to conclude that everything in Daniel and Revelation is all literal. A literal beast, a literal dragon, a literal bear, a literal number, a literal name a literal lamb. Let me ask you a question. Can a literal lamb save you from your sins? No. It's referring spiritually. Does that make sense, everyone? Now, what do we do now? Psalms chapter 15, verse 1 through 5. Notice the question. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Tabernacle is sanctuary. Who may dwell in your holy hill? That's Mount Zion. He who walks, what everyone? Uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. This is referring to the 144,000. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friends. It continues. 
in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put up his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be what, everyone? They shall never be moved, meaning to say they shall stand when Jesus returns. Amen? Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 466. Notice what she says. The coming of Christ does not change our characters. It only fixes them forever beyond all change. What does this mean? We need to start preparing our own characters right now. We cannot wait to the second coming or we cannot wait to the, the seven last plagues to come and then all of a sudden, oh, I got to make right. I got to choose Jesus. I got to prepare my heart to be like Jesus. And then when Jesus comes, hide us from the face of Jesus. Nobody wants to do that, right? Inspiration is telling us that the character change will not happen at the second coming of Jesus. It starts today. Can you say amen? Adventist Home, page 16, paragraph 2. If you have become estranged, I'm going to end on hope. If you have become estranged and have failed to be Bible Christians, be what, everyone? Converted. For the character you bear in probationary time will be the character you will have at the coming of, of Christ. If you would be a saint in heaven, you must first be a saint on earth. She continues, the traits of character you cherish in life will not be changed by death or by the resurrection. You will come up from the grave with the same disposition, that's if you die in Christ, you manifested in your home and in your society. So how you act in your home, how you act in society, how you act in class is how you will come up. Jesus does not change the character at his what, everyone? At his coming, the work of transformation must be done when, everyone? Now. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. Oh, brothers and sisters, where are we heading in our destiny? Where is our walk with God? How many of us want to strive to become part of the 144,000. If that is your desire, please stand with me as we close in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Father, I pray that the message was clear tonight, that the 144,000 is your precious people that the 144,000 truly reflect the image of Christ fully, that the 144,000 are the ones who have survived the seven last plagues, the mark of the beast, had the victory over the beast, had the victory over its name, had the victory over its number. Oh, Father in heaven, we realize that perhaps our own lives and our own characters fall short of all the characteristics of the 144,000. And Father, we realize this evening that without you, Lord, we are nothing. But Father, you had promised and you said to us that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And Father in heaven, you promised that you would never leave us nor forsake us and that you are with us always, even to the end of the world. Father, you had promised also that you have loved us with an everlasting love. Father, help us not to forget your mercy, your grace, and your unconditional agape love you have towards us. Oh, Father in heaven, we come to you right now just as we are sinners in need of a Savior. And Lord, all of us, you know our heart's desire to be among the 144,000 who will never taste or experience death, just like Enoch and Elijah who never experienced death. Father, help us to have the characters 
of the 144,000. And Father in heaven, help us to surrender all to Jesus. Help us to surrender our sins to Jesus so that when Jesus comes, we can stand in the presence of the Lamb. Father, this is our humble prayer, for we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Let everyone say, Amen.